All right, I reckon it's a good time to start. So uh, welcome everybody to Zoom and to another Stormwater Vic webinar. I hope you're safe and going well. My name's Tracy Pham. I'm the chair of the events subcommittee for Stormwater Vic. Uh, and this week we're looking at uh, Victorian urban stormwater offsets. Uh, we do a deep dive into uh, op offsets and options for funding stormwater projects. Uh, this is a really important topic, so I reckon you're going to get a lot out of this webinar. In the industry, we're always asking, uh, how do we get more money for stormwater so that we can invest it in long-term stormwater goals? Uh, so this webinar will look at how to set up uh, offset schemes for councils, and follow the four, uh, stories of four councils at various stages of their schemes. But first I'd like to kick off by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the land that uh, this webinar is based. <clears throat> Stormwater Victoria recognizes the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and their connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who have joined us today. As usual, the session is being recorded. So if you have any issues with that or any technical issues, please send us a private uh, chat message below in the toolbox, or you can send us an email. If you have questions for the speakers, feel free to pop them in the Q&A panel. Uh, that's also located below in the Zoom uh, toolbox. During the discussion session, please upvote your questions so I know uh, what we should focus on. The session is sponsored by Marsden Jacob Associates, who are the leading economics, public, public policy, markets and strategy advisors. They help to shape the future wisely. And thanks to them, we're able to keep these webinars free and open to the stormwater community. So if you want to involved to support this uh, webinars, please send us an email and um, we'll get in touch with you. So webinar format. Um, next, we have Jamie Tayton from, uh, who is this SV president, and she will provide the president's address for a few minutes. I'll then formally introduce all of the panelists, including Jeremy Cheeseman, who will provide an overview of the uh, Victorian urban stormwater offsets for about 15 minutes. We will then have a Q&A discussion um, with, the rep with representatives from Mornington Peninsula, Moon Valley City, Darabin City and Kingston City Council. This will go for about 30 minutes. And it's gonna be a good opportunity for you to ask questions. Formal closing uh, will be at 1.30, but if there are remaining Q&A uh, questions, I will keep the session live for, um, for us to finish those questions. All right, that's all from me. Over to you, Jamie. Thanks, Trace. Well, look at us now, fresh out of lockdown, footloose and fancy free. So great to have you all to join us from your offices, homes, holiday spots, campsites, cars, and just about wherever you can get to us now. It's so good to have the ability to share the knowledge so wildly these days. A definite plus of our situation. We're so grateful for Marston Jacob, not Jacobs, I've just been corrected on that, for the sponsorship of the event today. Not only is Jeremy, Jeremy donating his time, but they've funded the background time and effort of the event coordinators to make this free for you all. It's really quite wonderful to operate with such a humble sponsor. They were so keen to sponsor the event, but really wanted the councils they worked with to be the prominent entities. They're really proud of the outcomes they've seen for each of them. And I'm sure you all agree and value it when a consultant can focus on the outcome and they forget their own needs. Thanks again to Marston Jacob and Jeremy for anchoring this event. As we know, the role of stormwater has played in the industry has morphed from a drained city to one that provides more value in the form of alternate water supply and the concept of shared or blue green spaces. Our wetlands and waterways and even passively irrigated verges have created areas for our community that weren't previously valued as they are today. Now we are starting to see the more financial impact it can have. Both positive and negative financial impacts can be found. 
And it really depends on your perspective and ultimately the size of your project. It's great to see the opportunities like these offset schemes step in to try and balance the cost for smaller and larger projects while providing council with another funding stream or source for stormwater projects. I know Melbourne Water's rationalisation of their Living River scheme into priority catchments has left some councils high and dry, so to speak. So a more resolved and internalised alternative will certainly be well received, I'm sure. Given the introduction and formalisation of the General Environmental Duty, or the GED, I think we'll see the industry transform even further now. Property developers, owners, councils need to meet their environmental obligations to the general environment and importantly to, our, importantly to us, our waterways. Becoming law in July 2021, businesses are responsible for protecting the environment and the human health. This means the approach to protection of human health and the environment has changed. The expectation is that they will need to manage their activities to avoid the risk of environmental damage and must also respond if pollution does occur. I feel this is a little like the introduction of Clause 56 in the industry. It'll come out of nowhere for some. Offset schemes like this one we're about to hear about, or several of them, will be perfect opportunity for everyone to meet their obligation while creating shared, valued and considered water quality and quantity assets. Now, before we hear a little bit more from Jeremy and his panel, Another event that's very dear to my heart is the upcoming National Stormwater Conference. Whilst we all want to see face-to-face -face event in mighty Melbourne, I think this event of the past week has shown us maybe we're not quite ready for that. But as luck would have it, National have already committed to a completely virtual and immersive online conference. And now I'm the conference convener. Let's call it the conference ambassador. I'm one of the great team pulling together the final touches and getting everything involved. So if you haven't already registered, head to the website and check it out or catch up with me later on and I'll share some more info with you. Now hand back over to Trace for the next part of today's session. Thank you. All right, Jamie, thanks for that. Um, and I like conference ambassador. I think that that's a nice title for you. Um, okay, I'd like to introduce all of the uh, people on the panel today. So we have Jeremy Cheeseman from Marsden Jacob. Uh, Jeremy is an environmental and resource economist and director at Marsden Jacob Associates. He has been fortunate to work with Kingston, Mooney Valley, Darabin, Mornington Peninsula and other Victorian councils to implement the in innovative stormwater offsetting approach that are now current with these councils. Jeremy was part of the 2018 Stormwater Management Advisory Committee and uh, that recommended that Victoria should establish an effective soil um, and stormwater offset program. On the panel today we have uh, more, uh, Melissa Barrage from the Mornington Peninsula Council. She is an environmental management manager whose career has included working in private business, state and local government. She's also worked uh, interstate and overseas. She's been with the Mornington Peninsula Shire since 2014. From Mooney Valley City Council, we have Rowena Josk. Rowena is a senior sustainability officer and her work focuses on integrated water management and planning for a city that is green, water sensitive, cool and climate adapted. Claire Fenby from the uh, from Darabin City Council is also going to join us. She is a water and wastewater strategy officer uh, within the climate emergency team. She has five years experience in the environmental management and water space and eight years experience in local government. Before her career in local government, she completed a PhD uh, on Australian climate history uh, and it's titled Experiencing, Understanding and Adapting to Climate and to climate in southeastern Australia from 1788 to 1860. And finally, on our panel, we have Emily Butcher from Kingston City Council. Emily has worked uh, with the council for over a decade uh, on environmental strategies and helped to develop the award-winning integrated water cycle strategy in 2012. She also developed the Kingston's uh, stormwater in lieu contribution scheme and conti continues to help other local governments implement such schemes. Uh, thank you all to the uh, panelists joining us and sharing your knowledge uh, to the wider stormwater community. All right, Jeremy, take it away.
Thanks, everyone. Um, I'll just check to make sure that you can uh, see my screen now. Is that uh, is that all right? Thumbs up. Fantastic. Yep. Perfect. Um, so. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Jeremy. I'll start up by acknowledging I'm speaking from um, Wurundjeri land today in the Kulin Nation and recognise and acknowledge um, all First Nations people on this call. Um, secondly, look, I'd also start out by acknowledging and saying um, um, thank you to the panellists who are going to be here today, um, the council people who gave their time, but also to, you know, stormwater offsets in Victoria, as we'll discuss today, are now quite mature and advanced. Um, and um, are starting to become uh, business as usual. And that's really only happened as a result of a whole range of actors across government, water businesses and councils. And so without, without naming people, um, you know, um, kudos goes to, of course, all of the councils who have already implemented stormwater offsetting schemes, Kingston being the first scheme to, uh, to trial and set one up. But also kudos to, to Melbourne Water and particularly the, the Living Rivers um, funding um, that, that they've provided towards these stormwater offset schemes and the way they've interacted with councils, councils to help promote these schemes. Um, and then, of course, also DELP as um, in terms of the overarching policy guidance. Um, and one of the things that we'll discuss today is that um, the Victorian government has recently come out with some quite clear um, um, signals that they support the implementation of these council based schemes in Victoria and they're just kicking off as of this week um, a process over the next couple of months to develop guidance um, really a toolkit um, that um, victorian councils will be able to pick up and follow to um, develop and implement your own um, your own stormwater offset schemes so you know in some we've got a series of green lights here and um, Really, this this discussion today, um, we were motivated to, um, to to sponsor it because we we really think um, that stormwater offsets are a really valuable part of delivering better outcomes, stormwater outcomes in Victoria, and you know a really important part of um, council's um, WUSA toolkit. And we know just from conversations that we've been having around the traps that. There are a heck of a lot of questions and we figured the best way to uh, to answer those questions and, and have really open good discussion is by having people who have actually gone through the process of implementing um, those schemes have open discussion with you so you know what we're really looking for today is me to give a very very quick introduction um, to what stormwater offsets are um, and then really just spend a half an hour of this of, of q a so that you can ask all the questions you want um and um hopefully um everybody on the panel can provide you with um with answers and guidance on the next step of the journey the only other thing that we'd note is um I, I apologize we usually put together powerpoints for this sort of stuff but this time we haven't done that um what we've done is um uh, uh, last year with uh with a couple of councils and a couple of other industry folk who you can see on this front slide we um, put together a um a guidance paper a very short guidance paper on what Victorian stormwater offsets were and um, how you could go about implementing them. And probably most important for us in the back of that document are uh, the contact details of all of the people who have actually implemented the scheme. So really it's a calling card for to say, if you're interested, pick up the phone and have a conversation with somebody who's done it before. Um, so what we've done, um, what you can see up on the screen right now is that that industry note. Um, we've updated that in industry note uh, for, for this presentation, and then Stormwater Victoria has um, um, is going to put the industry note up on the website and mail a link to everybody who's um, who's on this call today. So, really, my job today is just to very quickly go through the industry note, um, some of the key points, to give you an introduction to what the Victorian stormwater offsets are. Um, and really to set up the uh, the basis for discussion and then what you'll see is you'll be able to access that industry note get more details but again most importantly get contact details for people if you want to pick up and have a conversation um, around some aspect of, um, of what you hear today so very briefly and again I apologize for the screen screen size um, we'll start out by saying that the, the background context for this is that there are now several councils, four councils, um, plus a couple of others who are looking at schemes who have established uh, stormwater offset schemes in Victoria over the last couple of years. Uh, and they are using those offset schemes to effectively address stormwater management issues that are um, occurring as a result of impervious area within their council areas. But, 
throughout this industry note, we've provided hyperlinks wherever we can to, for example, Kingston and Mooney Valley, where they've already set up resources and work examples that you can have a look at. And so you'll see as we go through all of the links to, uh, to documents where you can see more resources. Probably the key messages by way of introduction are, are what we've got highlighted there on the first on, on the first slide. And, and so the, the first point is that we've now done this before. Stormwater offset and the offsetting approach um, that is supported by the Victorian government is now for councils is now well established. And so several councils, all of the councils who have set up their stormwater offsetting schemes have followed a same the, or a very similar process for how they went about setting up the stormwater offsetting schemes. And the way that the offsets are structured and the offset um, payment is calculated is the same. And that's really important because essentially what it means is that for developers and for councils alike, even though we're doing these offset schemes individually, they're all, cons they're all consistent with each other. You know, and that's something that, again, you know, the Victorian government, but also developers want. You know, they, they want to be able to go between councils and understand that the rules of the game are the same. The charge might be different between councils, um, and we'll talk about uh, why that is later on. But the process that you, the application process that you go through is, is the same. So they're, they're, they're starting to get that consistency. And so yeah, the, one of the clear messages is there's an established process um, for both setting them up and also for essentially what the developer and, and the council do when they interact um, for the stormwater offset. A second um, really important point that we emphasise through our work as we set these schemes up is that these, these offsets, we call them innovative, but they're, they're, all we mean by that is that they're fundamentally different from other offsets that you might be familiar with, for example, um, the Melbourne water offset or um, offsets being run in other states. And they're different for a couple of important reasons that, um, that we can discuss later on. But one of the key reasons is that the schemes, the payment, um, of the offset actually covers the full life cycle cost of the stormwater asset. And so what we mean by that is it doesn't just cover the capital cost, it covers the cost of setting up the assets by council and also the ongoing operating and maintenance. And there is also a buffer built into the, the pricing for when things go wrong. Because we all know that you know, stormwater assets don't always work perfectly. Um, there are risks, things that, that happen. Um, so essentially, the offset schemes that we're setting up and the pricing of those schemes are covering those costs and including a buffer for risk. And that basically means that councils, uh, you, or what we're seeing so far is that councils aren't getting caught out. So they're not being left with a obligation that you've got to fund out of rate revenue or some other bucket because essentially we've underpriced the offset. offset. The other thing that it means is that developers don't get a free ride because they're not just paying for the capital component, they're actually paying for the full life cycle costs. So that asset that is that is effectively offsetting the um, impact that the developer has created, they're paying for the full life cycle cost of that asset, not just part of that. And we think you know that's a fundamental equity principle and it's really important. The third point is that um, councils can choose you can choose as councils, you can choose your own level of offsetting. Um, the Victorian government is going to um, um, provide guidance on how to set the level of offsetting that, um, um, that you may want to uh, developers allow. But one of the things that we'll see when, and you'll see when we talk with um, councils later on today is that some of the councils have allowed, let's say a 20% offset. So developers have to achieve 80% compliance on site. And then, you know, as we know, maybe the last 20% starts to become difficult and we, or we start to put in assets that might not function the way that we expect. And so some councils are saying for that last 20%, if you've got a gap, you can pay in an offset in that arrangement. So they're providing flexibility that way while still requiring that developers meet their compliance obligations on site. Other councils are letting the um, developers have a 400% offset at this point. And so Kingston and I think Mornington Peninsula Mel are um, both 100% offsets. So really there is a design issue there um, that says um, councils um, have scope to choose the level of offsetting that you want to allow for developments. Um, another really important point by way of introduction is this last point that we've just added down below, which is um, one of the things is one of the really important things to keep in mind when we're thinking about offsets is that they're, they're not a magic pudding. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, 
a lot of councils is that offsets should fund additional investments over and above investments in water that councils are already planning. So if you have a, a council works program for IWM and that already has funding allocated, that funding shouldn't be substituted out to, 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 to use stormwater offset um, payments. That's, that's not what stormwater offset payments are about. Stormwater offset payments are about offsetting impacts of developers by going over and above what we already intend to do. And we can talk about what that means. We put, as economists, I put my nerdy hat on, we call that additionality, but we can talk about um, later on if we want how councils can achieve that in additionality by still, you know, if you've got, for example, an, an IWM or a Wooset inf infrastructure plan, you can still achieve additionality within that infrastructure plan, but it's just how you go about demonstrating that what you are doing is additional with the offset that's really important. The only other point that's not listed there by, um, by way of introduction is that, as I said earlier on, the Victorian government does support um, the development of council run offset schemes um, and DELP at the moment is currently leading a piece of work um, for people who know De Dennis Corbett and um, Deb Brown and the team. Uh, they're currently leading a piece of work over the next, I think, four to six months where they will be developing guidance for councils on how to develop council-run stormwater offset schemes. And that will include a toolkit of resources that you'll be able to draw on um, so that when you decide that it's time to, um, time to um, develop an offset scheme, there is essentially a you know, almost a, a cookbook that you can follow um, if you like um, uh, to uh, to develop these schemes. Importantly, all of that guidance is going to be based off the um, approach that the four councils that we've got here today have developed. So we're not creating anything new um, really underneath the underneath the sun when we're doing this. It's really codifying and documenting the the, the, the process that you know these four councils that we have here today have really developed and championed and, and all of the lessons that they've learned along the way. All right. So very quickly, I'm going to assume that people have some um, background knowledge of what offsets are. Um, but just very briefly by way of introduction, um, offsets, you can see either visual either through the words or the visual that you've got here on the right hand side. The visual on the right hand side, by the way, is um, um, from Mooney Valley and Kingston City Council's websites. Um, this is something that developers see when they go through the application process. But an offset essentially is a financial contribution paid by developers um, when, as you know, everybody on, on, on this call, uh, I assume, knows, developers have obligations to treat um, stormwater quality at the moment to BEPM standards. The recent amendment VC154 has expanded that um, to not just be um, residential de developments, but now to include pretty much all impervious services that are being created. Um, and so developers have that obligation to meet those stormwater quality requirements. Um, the way the stormwater offset works is that in, in some situations, if a developer um, has difficulty, for example, uh, achieving full compliance on site for some reason, um, or it is incredibly costly for them to be able to achieve that compliance on site, there is an option, an offset allows a developer to offset their obligation by paying a financial contribution amount and it's a voluntary financial contribution amount to council and council then takes on the obligation to deliver those off the, those um, that water quality treatment um, offsite for the uh, for the agreed impervious area. Um, again, we can um, we can talk later on around exactly how that how you go through the process of figuring out um, how to calculate what the offset charge should look like and how you go about setting those up. But it really is as, as simple as that. So what a developer sees when they come through the, an application process at the moment with a Kingston or a Mooney or um, in the future with a Mornington and, and a Darabin is um, they'll discuss requirements with council. And then the um, applicant can either decide to meet their stormwater requirements on site or some of this um, offset um, or, or to offset some of their requirements. The offset con con contribution, excuse me, is then calculated for part or all of the um, offsite treatment. And then in parallel, um, if they're doing works on site, they submit their, um, they still continue to submit their stormwater designs for approval. And at that point, when the planning process is, when it's approved, 
um, monies are exchanged and then the council takes on the obligation to um, deliver the equivalent or better stormwater treatment offsite. Um, if I haven't been clear on that, I'm happy to go back and, and explain it. Um, probably some people on councils can explain it a lot more, uh, a lot better, or a lot more intuitively than, than I can because um, they've done it lots and lots of times now. Um, quite just briefly, that we think you know, it's fair to say we're true believers in stormwater in, in, in stormwater offsets um, for a range of reasons. We we have been working in the in stormwater for um, for, for quite a while and. Um, we've had the benefit of working with a lot of people um, in the industry who really um, are observing on the ground how um, stormwater is working in Greater Melbourne. And so what we've seen with offsets is that there are a range of benefits that can be provided um, by them. And I, I won't go into, the, into all of these in great detail because I think it's better that um, we do it through the Q&A, but, but for us, one of, we see a couple of key benefits. One is that in most councils, councils in, can deliver stormwater offsets or they can deliver treatment of impervious areas um, far more cost effectively than can be done on site. Um, and so that means you can get more bang for your buck in terms of stormwater treatment for the same amount of money. That's one key thing. Um, another thing is that um, stormwater offsets can, and what we've seen in particular with people, with organisations like Kingston, they, they can pro provide a, you know, a significant pool of ring fenced funds for investment in more assets. And so one of the things that we know and, you know, we've, we've heard you know, over the decade is that we, we have very good ideas of more investments that councils can make. We have the technical capacity, we have the will, but we don't have the funding and we don't have the funding certainty, um, especially if, you know, we're operating in a rate constrained environment and we're looking to, and you know, each year um, stormwater investments go up against a whole bunch of other things um, when we when we decide how we're going to deliver, you know, share the rate, the general rate revenue. So offsets do provide a ring, sense, ring fenced source and, and we really do mean ring fenced because when this money comes in, it doesn't physically go into the general rate revenue account. It goes into a separate dedicated account that has, that has um, ties around it. And so it can only be used for stormwater investments. And, and that's, you know, a really, uh, that's an, a really important point. Another point is that um, it does provide developers and councils with flexibility. So we, we know that in some situations, um, councils can be more effective um, in delivering stormwater works offsite than potentially works on site. Councils have when they take on the obligation they take on the obligation to maintain the asset over its life cycle with with some on, on site works you know what we've seen is that the the obligation goes in but then there's no guarantee that that um, asset is going to be maintained the way that it needs to to, to act as a as a as a, a, a stormwater quality treatment asset and so in some situations and not all the situations but in some situations Offsets will provide councils with surety that the offs that the uh, stormwater treatment that we're expecting to get from these assets actually occurs, and it also provides developers and the public with a clear line of sight through councils' monitoring, evaluation, and reporting that these assets are doing what they're supposed to be doing, and, and we think that's a really um, important outcome. Another thing that um, that is really important um, in terms of um, one of the benefits of offsets is that councils have the right to uh, reject applications and require developers to achieve compliance on site. And you know in th that is going to be so. You know we want to make it very clear that offsets, stormwater offsets, should not be uh, um, eligible to all parties in all situations. You know if we are operating environments where we have sensitive um, receiving waters. Um, and receiving waters that are, that are of high ecological integrity, then there is a very strong rationale for doing mandating that the, those works occur on site or near, near the site. Um, in other situations, um, offsets are going to be appropriate. So, and it's councils who have the discretion of, of, of deciding what that looks like, and you know, in cooperation with Delp and Melbourne Water, of course. So, it does having an offset mechanism in place doesn't obligate you; it gives you the option. All right, um, I'll get off my soapbox and I'll just very quickly go to um, the, the process. Um, it's probably, again, best that we talk through the process with, um, with people who have done it before. As we said earlier on, we've been fortunate to do this um, quite a few times with councils now. The process and the, and the toolkit that sits underneath it is, is it exists and um, 
one of the things that will be happening with DELP over the next couple of months is essentially this process that you see mapped out here at a high level will be um, codified and, and structured into, into a resource that councils will be able to use. Um, and as part of that, our understanding is DELP will also be going out and consulting with people and, and the industry around the around the, uh, the guidance and the resources and testing those and refining it with them. So we'd also say that if you're interested in being involved in that process, um, maybe just make that known to Stormwater Victoria or afterwards or send us an email and we'll make sure that the team at, um, at DELP get it. Otherwise, send it directly to Dennis Corbett if you, uh, if you know, his, know him and have his contact details. The process for setting up um, a stormwater offset though is pretty, um, is, I'm not gonna say straightforward because it's easy for somebody not sitting in council to say that something's straightforward. Um, typically um, from the process that you see mapped out here um, will take um, anywhere from um, probably four months to eight months to go through the process. And that's, um, I can see Mel smiling already. That doesn't include the council um, consultation. So consultation with councillors, this is really, the, the processes um, that we go through is the first thing that we need to do is we need to identify offsite solutions. And so really that's, think about your, your council WUSID plan. Um, you'll go through and identify, you might have an IWM strategy already. And as part of that strategy, you will identify where WUSID or IWM assets could possibly operate. And as part of that, you will either do music or storm modeling or something like that that will allow you to calculate the nitrogen um, the, the nitrogen um, that um, is going to be captured by those assets and, and managed by those assets. And sorry, I, I forgot one fundamental point. Nitrogen is the um, is the unit of exchange ultimately in these in these offsets. So this is a stormwater quality offset. So typically, as part of doing that work, you'll be you'll have gone through and identified the assets, identified the uh, volumes of stormwater that are going to be harvested, the nitrogen um, benefits, and, and other types of benefits through that. That's part one of your calculations. That gives you an understanding of what it's going to cost council potentially as a cost over the life cycle cost to deliver nitrogen offsetting services. The other part of uh, the calculation is understanding the way that we do it and the way that the Victorian offsets are set up is to understand what it actually costs developers potentially to um, undertake equivalent works on site. And so typically the way that we do that is that we work with people um, who generate the music reports and we go through uh, music reports and essentially come up with on-site equivalent on-site calculations that gives us an understanding for different development types, uh, different extensive development types, what the sort of cost curve looks like for, um, for achieving the um, stormwater quality on-site. From that point, that really defines the sort of what we call the minimum and maximum flags. And we then work with councils to set the offset price between those minimum and maximum flags. So between what it's going to cost council and between, and sort of more we, we essentially price the offset at more than it costs council, but at less than what it's going to cost developers on average. And so, you know, as I said earlier on, this is a fundamentally different way to something like a developer charge or a Melbourne water offset is, um, is calculated because we're covering the full life cycle cost but we're also charging at above cost to council so that again we're building in a risk buffer for council and it's at council's discretion where you set that price between those two flags after that we another thing that we do is we go through the, the that critical step of eligibility criteria so again we said you know offsets not should not be eligible to everybody who comes they should be um, eligible in certain situations where we are comfortable with that um, for example that we're not in receiving waters that have high ecological value. So really eligibility is, is a geographic eligibility within the council region, and it's also um, in potentially um, different development types. After we've set up all of that, it goes to council. Council approves a pilot. Um, Mel will talk about that. That happened by the sounds of it um, yesterday um, in Mornington Peninsula, went to, went to council. Um, after the, um, uh, the pilot is approved, some of these steps are interchangeable. Um, there's consultation with developers around the offset scheme and how it's going to operate. Increasingly, what we're finding as we're going through these consultations is that more and more developers are already familiar with the offsets because it's already operating in other councils. There are some steps involved in setting up fund administration, reporting and governance. We've mapped out those processes as part of those, the work that we've done previously and dealt with 
provide um, in its guidance will provide a template of what that can look like. But again, it's going to be different for each council. Um, and again, councils will be able to talk about um, what that process looks like. And then after the scheme is actually up and running, we have that ongoing process of monitoring and evaluation and reporting. And that's, that's really fundamental because it goes back to showing that council is discharging its responsibility and it's just charging its responsibility in a way that goes over and above probably what could have been achieved on the site. Thanks, Jeremy. Are you you happy with that? Shall we go to the discussion discussion panel now? All right. I'm thinking um, as I'm introducing the uh, discussion panel, maybe uh, you you could answer how's it going with the scheme and. Do you have a sense of how much you've raised using stormwater asset, uh, offset schemes? So maybe I'll start with Claire first from Darabin City Council. Hello. Um, how's it going with our scheme? We are still in the investigation process. So we haven't um, yet gone to council on this. We, I guess it's highlighted that we really need to get the right people in the room from the outset um, and getting the right data together to understand, I guess, the, the offset rate is kind of key. So it's going well, though I know that there will be more challenges ahead. I've found this process to be relatively straightforward, but I think the greater consultation will be um, challenging also. Um, and so, no, we haven't raised any money, um, but I'm sure okay. I can speak to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I should have mentioned before that um, on the panel, can we please um, try to reduce how much um, Victorian jargon that we're using? Because, uh, yeah, we've got people from other states and apparently um, it's been a bit confusing for them. So BEPAM is Best Practice uh, Environmental Management. Uh, we use that term a lot in Melbourne, but we'll try to um, not use it so so much. And the other thing I had to say before we continue is if you have any questions, make sure you pop them in the Q&A panel and not in the chat. Um, otherwise, yeah, it, it'll get confusing. Um, thanks again for that, Claire. Uh, maybe, Emily, if you can give us a brief about how Kingston City Council we've got, is gone. Yeah, so I suppose I describe us as the bleeding edge. We were the first council uh, to take on these changes. So that was in 2017, the two year trial. And then from 2019, it's been um, kind of embedded into the planning process. Um, we've raised uh, just uh, under $2 million in that time. So I think it's going well. It's still not probably at the level we'd expected. We had originally forecast about a million dollars a year. So, um, yeah, we'll see how it continues to go. Yeah, all right. Um, all right. Uh, Rowena, how's your um, offset schemes going? Our how's scheme, it going? How's it going? Uh, it's, go it's going well. Um, like Emily, um, we haven't, the contribution level hasn't been as high as we. Um, uh, initially expected, but we've um, we started our scheme in July of 2019, so it's been running for about 20 months now, a bit more than a year and a half. We've raised um, 225,000. Sorry, I should say we've um, there's been 225,000 dollars contributed to the scheme, um, and that's uh, to treat just over 4,000 uh, meters squared. Great. Um, and finally, uh, Melissa from Mornington Peninsula, are you around? Yeah, I am. Here I am. <laughs> so <There> you are. <laughs> uh, we've just taken um, a briefing to council on um, going out to introduce the pilot scheme um, and to consult with developers on that pilot scheme. And we've also, um, our executive couldn't be more complimentary of the initiative um, because in a budget constrained environment, this is a really good approach. Um, so yeah, we haven't received any dollars yet, um, but uh, we've got full, 
full support of our organisation to move forward at this point. Great. So I think that um, everyone's at mostly the early stages, but different stages of the of the offsets. Um, how long has it taken to set up, and how long will the whole thing go for? Basically, does anyone want to jump in and start, or I'll start to point I, fingers? I, I, I'm happy to to start. Um, I, I've been at Mooney Valley for about a year a year now so um all the hard work was done um well before I started I understand that it, it took a couple of years to to set everything up um I, I think probably um we at Mooney Valley was watching what Kingston would were doing and when they set their scheme up um Mooney Valley were really interested and sort of started the the process of setting something um similar up, although quite different at the same time, but but similar. But um, we kind of yeah we copycatted and um, uh, got a lot of help from from Kingston and spent about two years uh, doing a lot of work to to establish our scheme. And now, how long has it taken you to get to this point? Uh, it's a good question. So I think we started looking at this when, when Kingston first announced that they were doing it as well. Um, so that'd be back in 2018. Um, so it's been a while, um, but I couldn't highlight enough just the importance of getting everybody involved all the way through the journey at every different level of the organisation as well. So, um, yeah, it, it's... It, while it's been a long journey, I think it's been incredibly worthwhile and I think it will get easier um, as now we've got, you know, a handful of councils that are really, um, you know, increasingly becoming experienced in this space. I feel like Darabin's path has been um, much more straightforward because it's been an iterative process and learning from um, the different ways that schemes have been set up, um, particularly with uh, the different offset levels. Um, was something that gave us food for thought. So we received our Living Rivers funding in June, July 2020. So I think our process will be much quicker because we've learned exactly what's involved from you, you guys and, um, yeah, what needs to happen. Yeah, so that was about... So that, that would be my oh. reflection as well. It's sort of... It's... the. Kingston and the and the, and the um, Mooney Valleys of the world were, were um, putting in offsets in a time when the, the you know the policy space wasn't clear yet. So it's very much as you know Emily said, it's on the bleeding edge. But um, what we've seen, for example, with with Claire and, and Darabin is that um, we can do this now within six months um, to get you to the point of um, council approval. So. Great. Um, we've got a lot of questions here, so I'm just going to almost pick them at, at random. So the next question we have is, what are the, some of the lessons that you've learned from the process? Maybe, Emily, I'll start with you, considering Kingston um, was one of the first first ones of the, of the rank. Yeah, sure. So I think my number one learning has been um, track and report on things better. So we probably haven't integrated our tracking and monitoring into um, our planning system very well. So that's pathway we use in terms of the management data management system. So upon reflection, I would have um, spent the time doing that. And that was definitely the learnings that I pass on to other people. Um, we very, because we were a first, we also kind of went very softly, softly to begin with. And I think launching with more noise and a bigger bang would be better because it gets the awareness out that that opportunity now exists for developers to take up that option. So they're probably my two key learnings. Okay. Does anyone have any extra learnings to add to that? Uh, I, I, I think at Mooney Valley, um, one of the things that we've done over the past year um, is to go through a process to, to set up a, a kind of administration and, and reporting process. Um, we worked with uh, a consultant, Jamie Comley, to, to do that. Um, and he spent a lot of time working through with um, all the different staff who are involved in the project um, to, to work out a process. So I think that's been very worthwhile. And I guess another thing to note um, in 
through that process, um, we also spoke to developers and, and I was involved in a bit of that as well. And doing just actually um, talking to the developers about how the scheme is working for them and what um, would incentivize, incentivize or what does incentivize the scheme for them uh, has been quite a valuable thing for me to have been involved in over the past year as well. Um, we've got another one uh, from Nasheen. What happens if the development is located in a DSS scheme uh, uh, that Melbourne Water have? Uh, can developers uh, still pay offset? What's the DSS? DSS, sorry, Development Services Scheme um, by Melbourne Water. So maybe Jeremy, you might have an idea around this or? I think um, Emily and others know the answer to it. So if they want to, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but yeah, if it's covered by the DSS, then it's covered by the DSS. It's not, they can't double dip. Correct, so that's an important thing. I think um, Mel at uh, Mornington Peninsula, you had to consider that carefully. So Kingston, we're lucky we've only got a very small amount that's covered by that. So it wasn't a huge, yeah, you know, we're worried about that overlap and the potential for double dipping, but it is something absolutely you need to be mindful of map. And I think consider that when you're developing a scheme like this. Uh, Carola, Carolyn Cavallo asks, any advice for regional councils or councils with limited development income? Pretty interesting. Maybe Jeremy being the economist, you might have some idea um, on this. Look, I think you know, every council is going to be different. Um, I think if you've got a situation where there is a development front and increasing impervious area, um, and um, again, you're not in one of those receiving environments where uh, the, the environment is sensitive, then there is an opportunity to, con to consider offsets. Um, in some ways, the best way to understand it is to you know, spend an hour talking to one of the councils about around their experiences um, and figure out um, if this is something that, um, that that will benefit your council. But then I think the other thing is that, you know, again, that one of the reasons DELP is putting together this, this guidance over the next couple of months is that um, they want to lower the cost to councils of setting up these schemes. Um, now that you know there is an established process and, and, and we can see that they're working and working well. So, you know, to the extent that that guidance is, is there, that should also lower the cost to councils. Um, I think as, as part of it also, my understanding, again, without uh, obligating DELP, my understanding is that DELP is maybe looking for one or two councils who uh, will be interested in piloting some of the resources as they go through. So that could be another low cost opportunity to um, to um, piggyback off the back of that. But again, um, um, that's possible. I, I can't guarantee that that's, uh, that's part of the uh, part of that work. I think also um, for those who are regional, you could look at the um, those land use types that are applicable in the planning scheme that VC154 requires stormwater management of. Um, so if you have predominantly um, permits for those land uses that aren't covered by VC154, then that could give you an idea of where, where your scheme might be applicable and where it might not be. And I would come back to the point of you need to also know where the assets are that you want to build with the money that you raise. And so if you don't have a clear understanding of where and why you want those assets, it's impossible to argue to get a funding source to deliver them. So you need to make sure it always comes back to what asset do I need where? And then that, the question that follows is how do I fund that? And of, another question that kind of follows on from that is um, have any of you found that it's been appropriate to take offsets from one part of the council to apply to a higher to higher value areas? And what was that decision process like? I think- Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah. At Mooney Valley, um, the, I, the thinking was that as the, um, the, the, the benefit is to the, 
the waterway um, and it doesn't really matter where in the count in the council that um, the the assets been been built the the benefits flowing onto the waterway so we we don't kind of localize the the um, the contribution and the, the assets that are built. Yep, agree. So that question of nexus is not required if, as long as you're receiving water is broad enough. Um, yeah, and I think the other thing to highlight, which I think some people, so Jeremy spoke about uh, ring fencing the funding. So the way that we've modelled it is on open space contributions. So in the Victorian planning scheme, there's requirement for open space contributions. We've modelled the fund exactly on that. So the same rigor controls reporting mechanisms around that, but it does mean that it's able to be spent uh, municipality wide. It might also be something that's quite uh, municipality specific. So compared to many others, Darabin is quite small. It's only 50 square kilometres. So it doesn't have that same urgency around where you locate assets, but other perhaps larger regional or um, Green Wedge councils can cover multiple river catchments. So there may need to be additional conversations for those types of councils. I think it's also important to not overlook where this is coming from in the sense that um, if you don't have a system like this in place, there is an option for them to pay the offset to Melbourne Water, um, which by no means does that necessarily get reinvested in the region that that um, development was undertaken. At least this scheme does actually invest it in the right council region um, to, you know, within those boundaries as opposed to um, going anywhere across the you know, the Melbourne metro area. Okay, and how do you choose where those um, funding, where the funding goes? Um, is there a co cost benefit process? I think that's up to each individual council to develop that kind of plan of where you're going to put the assets and that, that decision making or hierarchy is developed um, within your organisation. So that cost benefit needs to be your value proposition to the organisation and how you prioritise projects amongst what could be a long list. So Darabin had already carried out a prioritisation process for the municipality, which identified um, 10 large scale wooded assets, nine of which were stormwater harvesting. So then that report was used to guide this process as well. Uh, and at Mooney Valley, um, similarly, we have uh, a, a list of 18 large scale uh, wooded projects to build. We've also got uh, in our long-term strategic plan, which is called MV 2040, um, a, a 2040 target to so a corporate target to reduce our um, total nitrogen load by uh, 600 kilograms a year by 2040. Um, and there's there's eight projects that will contribute to that. So they're the projects that uh, the offset scheme um, won't contribute to because uh, the the our um, voluntary contribution scheme needs to has the addition additionality um, principle that Jeremy spoke about earlier. So we've then got uh, another list of 10 projects that um, won't contribute to our, our, our corporate target, which um, could be funded by the, 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 um, the voluntary contributions, as could any other projects that come along if they are um, cost effective. And, and, and likewise, we have a prioritisation of, of those projects. Um, okay, and do, does that relate to nitrogen reduction? Is that how the offsets are calculated? Or is it flow reductions? Does it vary? Jeremy, you might be able to answer this. So Kingston's is based on impervious area. Uh, right. Yeah, it's, it's, based on, it's based on impervious. We, we keep it simple. We don't expect that developers understand um, nitrogen as a unit of measure. So we, you know, we calculate the equivalent based on impervious area. Um, so it is a it is a nitrogen measure. Um, having said that, we all know um, that, um, and I think we discussed it earlier on with the um, with the volumetric standards that are going to come in under the uh, under the new EPA. There will be a volume based standard, and that will 
be a um, that standard will differ depending on the receiving waters. And so the way that we've set up these offsets and the way that the councils have set up these offsets is so that we knew that was coming. So we've set it up so that it will be able to adjust the offsets to incorporate a flow based standard as well. Um, one from Jennifer Butcher. How come the forecasted contributions are less than expected? Do developers prefer implementing Worcester Downs or paying, or paying for the offset? So in Kingston's case, because we allow the 100% offset, um, we're actually surprised that people don't often take up that 100%. So people are, are delivering a portion of the water quality outcomes on site and then offsetting a remainder. So that's why our um, contributions are lower than we'd forecast. Um, at Mooney Valley, I think we're still uh, looking at that, but I think uh, one fact, so at uh, Mooney Valley, our, um, our opt-in rate when we last looked at it was um, at about 8%, and I think we had expected it to be somewhere around 40%, and of that 8%, they're offsetting uh, 13, an average of 13% um, of their requirement, so they can offset up to, uh, up to 20, but they're offsetting 13. Um, there's probably a few factors. Um, one might be awareness of the the that the, the they can use this scheme or how, how the scheme works. Um, it's it's only been in place for for 20 months, so I think we're expecting that awareness to to grow over time and have a higher opt-in rate. I think another factor is um, Mooney Valley has been a bit unique in that we've had a um a, an, a dedicated officer, so a wizard. Um, education and compliance officer who uh, sits in planning um, and and his role has really been about working closely with developers to um, help them met, or, and this was before the scheme help them to meet their 100 percent requirement um, and make sure that they do meet their requirement that was in place for a couple that position was in place for a couple of years before the scheme started so we think that our development industry in Mooney Valley has just gotten really good at um, meeting their on-site requirements really well. So we, that's, um, we think that's a good thing. And I think for Mooney Valley, um, we're gonna do another big review of the, the program um, uh, soon. And we probably need to think about where we want that balance to be. Like, are we happy for that um, developers are, uh, are meeting their requirements on site? Um, and and are, are we happy that they're doing that well? Or do we wanna try and incentivize the, the scheme a bit more to, um, to contribute um, more to the scheme so Mooney Valley can meet their requirements for them. Okay, we have such a high volume of questions coming through. So I've been asked to extend the session um, to 1.45. Uh, if you need to leave, that's fine. We'll uh, pop this recording up uh, on the website and you can watch the remainder um, of whatever you've missed. Uh, all right, the next question, I think we touched on this a little bit, um, but do you have any problems with getting councillors to approve pilot or full schemes? If no, then why not? I think Rola, you mentioned, oh no, it was Melissa, you mentioned that the councillors were very happy so we're at the point where, so our executive, we're super supportive. Um, it's gone to our councillors in briefing um, and their decision will be in the next few weeks around, you know, support endorsement to go out for consultation with developers and so forth um, and to, to then take it to the pilot. Um, so I think from a councillor perspective, it's a means of trying to combat some of the budget constrained environments that we're really you know, councils are really challenged by at this point in time, um, even without COVID with rate capping, but COVID's just put another layer on that um, as well. So, you know, it is, it, it's, it's a good initiative and certainly our executives have, you know, what other opportunities um, across the board can we apply this type of thinking to? Has anyone else got any experience with their councillors? Uh, 
ours, no, were, okay, um, well, ours were supportive, but um, it took a long time to get the staff over the line, I think. So the, a lot of people spoke to the need for uh, engagement, uh, particularly with your planning area, very anxious that um, you'll get taken to a card or it won't be allowed. So I think spending the time reassuring them and now because there are so many of us that have done it before, that's going to make that conversation a little easier as well. And if I might okay. just add to that, we um, we actually undertook some independent additional legal advice, which no one else had done yet, um, just to dot the I's and cross the T's and have absolute surety um, that the scheme was, um, yeah, that it, it was a legal scheme as such, yeah. And we weren't going to be faced with paying back money later. <laughs> I think... Um, yeah, and how you put it promoted the schemes in a, in a general way, like to the public or to developers or... Jeremy, do you want to start start that off or should we...? Oh, no, look, I think they, each of the councils have done it differently. So um, I think that's part of the, you know, that's part of the story and the uniqueness of each council approach. Um, at Mooney Valley... Oh, sorry, Emily. Do you no, want to go? You go. No, you go. Uh, at Mooney Valley, um, it, it's at, we need to uh, report to our councillors and get approval for uh, our rate each year. So we're sort of doing a, a, a review each year of our, our scheme to set the, the rate. Um, and when we did that last time, uh, we were asked to um, do more promotion of the scheme and, and to get an understanding of de the development industry's awareness of the scheme. Uh, we we found it a little bit difficult because there aren't a lot of it's a very specific um, um, sector I guess and um, we don't have that many kind of direct we don't have newsletters for developers or or anything like that so we have we've done uh, stories in our um, our uh, kind of community newsletter that goes out to all residents but that's not very targeted we think we we want to try and work more with um, uh, like uh, engineering services and services that the development industry work with to, to make sure they're, and, they, and we know that they are talking to developers about the scheme, but we think that's probably a good um, avenue to communicate to the right people. Yeah, that's one question I had um, personally. How can the industry um, practitioners and other, and other companies help to support the scheme? The schemes. Yeah, well, that might be one way just to um, make sure they're aware of it and they're making their clients aware of it as well. I think it might also be really important for developers and their consultants to speak to councils because the more councils that set this up, um, there'll be a variety of different rules. It won't be across Victorian approach at all. So they might need to be aware that there are offsetting options available with some councils, but that the rules and requirements differ. Um, have you considered approaching the water authorities to identify um, a more regional based solution um, where offsetting could result in larger scale stormwater harvesting schemes or anything like that? So maybe um, who's Council is probably biggest. That might be easiest. I'm not sure. Mornington Peninsula, I reckon, by is quite area. big. <laughs> yeah, by area. By I think. area, we're big. <laughs> um, yeah, we work yeah. very closely with South East Water um, regardless. Um, so they're heavily involved in um, you know, the latest IWM plan that's being developed and, and you know, the... Um, as we progress around the Wusset master plan and so forth, that you know um, these sorts of initiatives should be developed in consultation with your local um, sort of retailer um, and and Melbourne Water, of course. So um, if you're doing that right, then that just sort of falls out. And it really starts to address some of the issues around you know the the, the IWM frameworks of co-funding co um, investments and starts to activate those and. Um, we're already seeing that happen. I think one of the other areas of future development is at, at the moment we're developing, we're in the, the stage of developing the council based, but there will be points where it's going to be really advantageous to 
everybody in environmental outcomes to be looking across catchments. And um, so water retailers will play a role in that um, working across councils, but that's, you know, need a couple more councils to set up so that we've got councils sitting next to each other where that can occur. It could be useful for councils who are further downstream can provide a, I guess, cash to upstream councils because they'll receive the benefit um, or for areas that, you know, might cover two council areas, um, yeah, it could reduce some of those issues. Well, given that, has there been any consideration uh, for this to be rolled out across the state um, in that there's a, some sort of state requirement so that the approach, the approach is more consistent across Victoria? Do you know where that's at or if there's going to be anything like that? Maybe Jeremy, you have an, a bit of a better idea. Uh, so the question, sorry, I was just um, distracted by some of the the, the great chat conversation <laughs> yeah, going on on the sidebar. <laughs> um, apologies. Yeah, there's a lot um, so of stuff going the, on. So the question was, um, is it a statewide approach? Um, and the short answer is yes, this is a statewide approach, but it is a council-based statewide approach. So one of the things that the Victorian government has looked at, um, and we were fortunate to help advise on as part of the MAC and some follow-up work was what structure of offsetting approach should we have? Should we, you know, should it be one run by one overarching authority or council-based schemes? And at this point, the Victorian government has, has um, um, made the clear choice that the council-based schemes is the, is the preferred first step recognizing that this could evolve into something else in the future, but council schemes are um, what they're gonna provide the, the support and provide the guidance on over the next couple of months. So, and that is all councils in Victoria, it's not just Melbourne metros. Yeah, and I think again, it comes back to because the money goes towards building assets and the assets need to at this stage be built locally. So coming back to that question again of oh, why the money going towards bigger assets for a lot of us, the entire drive of this is because of increased um, densification, increased um, impervious surfaces, limited land availability. Those big Melbourne water wetlands just can't be constructed. We're all pitching this kind of medium scale, so not lot scale, but somewhere else. And then that money needs to go towards delivering those. So until we had a statewide network of where those assets needed to go, there's no point having a statewide pool of money that gets directed. And I think also it might um, raise concerns perhaps for some people within councils because there's already been concerns about, I guess, full offsetting and the impact that that might have on local waterways. So that's one of the reasons that um, Darabin are investigating a partial 20% offset so that we still have some flow reduction at the source of the new imperviousness. Um, and we still have waterway benefits that are very localised and then the offset will still also be local. Um, that's been something that's raised internally as well. I think though it's worth noting that um, a key feature of the scheme can be you know, is that you, council has the right to reject uh, offset application and also you know whether it be to full, um, you know, full offset or par offset. So um, you have that flexibility um, if in your scheme potentially um, to say, no, you're in the wrong location, you're gonna damage the immediate waterway. So you need to actually, we can't let you offset there, you need to build. Uh, what key advice would you give councils who are interested in initiating the offset schemes in their own councils? And what is the first step? Uh, Emily, yep. Yep, identifying where you wanna put the assets is number one. So you need to have a clear plan on what you're going to build where. And then number two would be come and talk to all of us <laughs> and learn from all of us. We're all very open and willing to have those conversations. So reach out to someone. Um, and I'm, I have quite regularly have one hour chats with a group of people and we just kind of workshop through where they're at, what advice they need, next steps for them. So we're all here to help. Uh, okay, uh, one from Desmond. What are the, some of the pushback you've observed from developers at the early stages and how did you go around or how did you deal with it? 
I think one point that might have been missed, and I've seen it in the chatter a little bit, is this is a voluntary scheme. So there is still a requirement to meet best um, practice water quality outcomes. We are simply giving the developer the choice whether or not they achieve that on site or whether they pay us some money and we deliver that site, some, that, that, that outcome somewhere else for them. So if there is any uh, pushback, we simply go, that's fine, you can deliver it on site then and we'll work with you on how you need to change your, your you know, uh, drainage designs in order to achieve that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about um, pushback, but I guess we keep hearing the obvious that um, uh, costs are really important to developers and that cost incentive is, is really uh, important. So I, I guess if there's any pushback, it's, it's regardless of what the cost was, they, they'd like the, the cost to be lower. I'm also just watching some of the comments in the panel about impact on house prices. And the short answer is that um, if, you know, as an economist, you would, you would argue that if, um, um, and we would expect that if it's going to cost more to do on site, then they're going to choose to, to opt into, like, into an offset. So if anything, it's actually lowering um, costs for developers and therefore house prices not increasing. I think it's um, very important to be clear on that. I think the other thing that we're seeing is that we're, we're finding situations where, and again, probably council's better place to speak, but we're finding situations where developers that we've spoken to have said, look, it, it was about ballpark in terms of cost, but what it gave me was surety um, to be able to proceed um, at an earlier stage. And therefore I opted into the offset for that reason. Um, so it's not just all about the dollars. Sometimes it's about um, how it supports development processes. I think also the, um, I guess the economic picture is a bit more uh, nuanced than just the on-site um, approach that when you create a large blue green asset that can, um, I guess, drive property prices up because the area is more desirable or it's more comfortable to live in because of impacts on urban heat island effect and things like that. So um, when you start investing in those types of assets that can change the dynamics of a neighbourhood. And sorry to all the consultants in the room, the other feedback we've had is that it cuts out the need for quite so much consultant involvement because it's a much more straightforward process. Uh, so that's another uh, advantageous thing to developers as well. I have a question here from Jennifer who asks, how important is it to have a strong head of power within the planning scheme? Asking from Tasmania where the incoming planning scheme provides a broad head of power to condition a planning permit for stormwater quality quantity, but otherwise silent on stormwater. So I've seen a bit of chatter about that, the question about the mechanism used for us to implement it. Um, so I'm caveating this that I'm not a planner, uh, but basically we have it as a permit condition. So it's still the requirement to meet the best um, uh, water quality outcomes. And then it's um, by, and, and I always get the terminology wrong, but by the you know, responsible authority. And so that's either by meeting it on site or making the contribution. So again, it's the optional and it's a permit condition. And then the underlying, the underlying regulatory base or requirement sits in the Victorian planning policies for, um, for stormwater. And then we've seen advice as well that says it would be desirable to have some sort of guidance in your local planning policy, but given what we've got on the VPPs, you don't need it. And I think that's um, been key in raising interest in this type of offset scheme because now it is Victoria wide rather than a local planning policy requirement like it has been in the past. So that will probably differ state by state. Um, okay, so we've got heaps of questions. I'm just quickly reading through them. Okay, uh, this one's for Emily. Um, from your experience, do you think a centralised system is better for on-site um, or, sorry, a centralised system is better or an on or is it on-site system that you'd prefer? So I think this speaks to our approach. So part of the reason that we shifted to this was that we found that by lot scale decentralised water sensitive urban design, there is a risk that the um, property owner will not manage and maintain them. Uh, to achieve the water quality outcomes and uh, 
as we just saw more of them getting rolled out, we increasingly felt that they were failing. There's a whole conversation about how well they're audited and actually checked that they're, you know, um, constructed as per design. So taking all of that risk away and putting it in council's hand to deliver a medium, you know, scale asset that we design, construct, deliver and then maintain for us takes that risk of failure of those, you know, small localised assets, scaling them up and delivering them in a more coordinated approach is a better outcome. Oh, okay, great. Does anyone else want to add to that or we're happy with that answer? All right, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, I think we've got to start wrapping things up. So I've got a last question. Uh, that's uh, who would be the best person to speak to to delve into the economics of offsetting uh, regarding min and max flags um, that Jeremy mentioned? You wrote that question, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, so we we built the model that all of these offsets are schemes are based on. So we, um, and look, also just so people know, we're, we're, we're really fortunate to have been engaged, engaged by DELP to write the guidance that all of the future schemes are going to be based on. So we're, we're currently best placed to help with that. Having said that, um, right, so I think, count, oh. councils or um, all of the councils, we, uh, we, we leave all of our models with the councils. Um, because we believe in that transparency as well. So if you speak to councils and you want to see how it's done, um, again, you know, we're really fortunate that, the, you know, the, the councils that we have on this call are, are, are really open and sharing in the way that they go about do, doing their work. So um, if you feel more comfortable speaking to a council than a consultant, which I completely understand, go to them. Great. So I'm going to wrap things up. Any questions that are remaining, I'll collate them and I might send them around and we'll, we might post them on the SV website. So um, uh, please check out the upcoming events within the stormwater industry. We're thinking of putting on some very informal, very casual um, networking drinks so that we can all um, hang out whenever that's allowed or possible. That will be in March sometime. Clearwater and DELP have their online navigator tool. Uh, they're launching that in late March. Oceans Protect, uh, the webinar, they have a webinar on called Does Bioretention Actually Work? That's going to be on the 3rd of March. And we also have the 5th Water Sensitive Cities Conference from 15th to 18th of March. And so the, we've got a pretty jam-packed March. In April, we have the Stormwater National, National Conference. Uh, it's about new frontiers for stormwater. So please check out those events. As always, fill out the survey to, at the end of this session and let us know what you think of the webinar, what I, we can improve on and suggest some future topics that we could uh, discuss. Thanks again to the speakers for sharing their knowledge. Um, speaker gifts, our donations to Water Aid Australia. That goes towards getting clean water and facilities to communities that don't have them. Thanks to GEMS, Contessa and Jess for putting this all together and helping to manage that Q&A panel for me. Uh, and, and thanks for joining us today. Um, yeah, I'll send out those uh, remainder questions and hopefully we've covered a lot today. Thank you. See you next time.